Okay. Well, nothing to it but to do it. So, hello and welcome again to yet another story. As you can see, this one is extremely short, but that's okay because I have some educational material at the end that I thought was very fascinating. So, hopefully you will too. But I am going to say uh, you should be glad I'm actually making this video because a game came out that I have been absolutely addicted to and unfortunately I've been spending a lot <laughs> of my free time, a bit too much of my free time, playing that. Now in my defense, I did pick the one character who does slip into classical Japanese phrases every once in a while because of course I do, that's who I am, that's what I like, and she does use a katana. So you know, those are many of the reasons why I like her, among other reasons. <clears throat> anyway, without further ado, let's just get into the story. So once upon a time, there was a man by the name of Ono no Miya no Daijin, which to put it partly in English would be something akin to the Grand Counselor of the Ono no Miya. Ono no Miya being like a palace or a place, and Daijin being a really high-ranking official. Now, it might be pertinent to note that this man's name was actually Fujiwara no Saneyori. Not that that's actually important, but if you want to look up who this is and why he was known for, his name is Fujiwara no Saneyori. There you go. But our dude, Saneyori, was hosting a big feast. I don't know what the feast was for. It was for something. I do remember seeing that, that it was for a specific occasion, but in Heian period Japan, in the capital, they had feasts and celebrations and festivals every other nanosecond, so I don't know what this was for, but it just, it was happening, okay? It's important to the story. But the guest of honor at this feast was the Kujo Daijin, so the Grand Counselor of Kujo, Kujo being likely the street that his main residence was on. Now this man's name was Fujiwara no Morosuke. Again, in case you want to know who this is, you can look him up. But he was the guest of honor at this feast, and we don't have any details on the feast itself, what happened, why it was going on, just it was there. But what is important to actually know is that at the end of the feast, the host was supposed to give the guest of honor gifts at parting. You know, something to send him along home with. Usually it could be something like horses, swords. Usually, however, it was very, very fine clothing. As we have discussed in previous videos, clothing was almost something like a currency to the elites of ancient Heian Japan. They dealt a lot in clothing. If you wanted to reward somebody or pay somebody for their services, or you just wanted to give somebody a gift, you could never go wrong with a nice set of kimono or robes or something like that. So our host decided to do just that. He gave the guest of honor some woman's kimono, among other things, I'm sure, but specifically we're focused on the woman's kimono that he was giving him. And this was a classy kimono, let me just say. First of all, it was a hosonaga style, which means thin and long. I'm assuming what that means is the sleeves were a little bit shorter than typical. It was kind of a new style that was coming into being around this time. It's very fancy. But not only that, it was a deep scarlet, a kurenai is specifically the word that they use, a brilliant red. And to top it all off, it had been treated in such a way that it had this brilliant sheen to it. And I'll get into the details of this a little bit later at the end of the video, but suffice to say, what they would do is they would treat some of their clothing with this starchy substance that would make their clothing shine and also make it somewhat water resistant. But in order to get this kimono to the guest of honor, the main host couldn't just hand it to the guy. No, 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 no. That's way too easy for ancient aristocratic Japan. No, no, no. The host had to give it to a servant who could then take it to a servant of the guest of honor, and then it could finally change hands. But this servant had the kimono and went running to go deliver it as per usual. But unfortunately, the guy was a bit of a klutz and he tripped, or I don't know if he tripped or he just fumbled this kimono, but he fumbled the kimono and he dropped it. But he didn't just drop it on the ground. Oh no, that would have already been bad enough. But he dropped it in such a way that one of the sleeves fell into the stream that was cutting through the property because most noble estates had a kind of small stream that went through in which you could collect water and wash things and whatever. You know, just having, with no indoor plumbing, having a little stream going through your property was a really good thing to have. But he dropped it in the water. And one of the sleeves specifically fell in there and got wet. And of course he freaks out and instantly picks it back up. Just whoosh. And of course now he wants to dry it off because heaven forbid we it, sh it shouldn't be wet this is this is nice clothing like imagine imagine dropping a multi thousand dollar suit in the water like this is mm, this is bad but luckily for him he 
picked up the kimono and he shook it once and all the water that was stuck on the sleeve was instantly flicked off. He and all the people around him who saw this noticed that the wet sleeve seemed like it was completely dry and everybody was astounded. And so what they did is they took the sleeve that was dry and the sleeve that was wet and they compared them and they looked completely the same. Like not a bit different, not at all in any way. Of course, everybody who saw this was supremely impressed. Like whoever treated this kimono was top of their game. They knew what they were doing. This was craftsmanship beyond anything they had ever seen thus far. And everybody praised this kimono, thought it was great. And he handed over the kimono, things were great, okay, awesome. And so, you can see that in the old days, there were such treated kimonos all over the place that were very common. However, thus is it said that kimono and clothing of such exquisite making is in fact very, very rare in our day today. So that's the end of the story. Again, extremely short story and not particularly exciting or interesting, except in the course of my studies and looking up some of this information, I came across something that I found supremely interesting. Like I mentioned a little bit earlier, there was a process by which the ancient Japanese would treat their really fine clothing. It was called utsu. Utsu literally means to like strike or to hit something. And one of the things that they would do is they would get this rack kind of a thing called a kinuta. And it was kind of like a bar that was suspended, you know, by two supports. And you would wrap your clothing around it and you would beat it with a stick, a specific type of a stick. And what this would do is it would get rid of the wrinkles in clothing because they didn't have irons at this time. So apparently you could just smash your clothing and that would take care of the wrinkles. But also during this process, I don't know if they stuck something on the stick that they used to strike the clothing with, but they put this kind of starchy substance on it, like I said, and they would use that to treat the clothing to give it a, a water resistant sheen. And so not only did your clothing shine like it was some sort of heavenly heaven robe something, whatever, but it also made it so that if you got rained on or if you were walking to go rendezvous with your lover in the early mornings or you were trying to escape getting caught by her father and you had to make your way through the dewy grass, you wouldn't ruin your clothing. But the thing about this whole process is it became very, very deeply associated with some strong poetic ideas. It was a very strong motif, specifically because when you would treat your clothing, you wanted to do it not when it was soaking wet right after you washed it, but after it had dried a little bit, but wasn't completely dry. So what would happen is if you take your clothing out in the middle of the day and you wash your clothing during the day, you bring it back inside, you take it somewhere, you hang it up to dry. And because Japan is a country that has lots and lots of humidity, it's not like it's going to dry in just a few hours. So usually it would be still kind of damp by nighttime or early morning the next day. And that's when you would want to wrap it around this kinuta and you would want to beat it into looking nice. But also, for whatever reason, everybody decided that the best time to do this was during the fall. There may be some very obvious practical reason for this that just escapes me and they didn't think to mention in the story because it's so obvious. But it also became highly associated with the fall. And so we've got two time slots, the fall and nighttime. The fall is probably the single most celebrated and most written about season in all of Japanese poetry. They loved the autumn because not only was everything beautiful, vibrant colors and harvest and so many wonderful things, the autumn moon was amazing, but also because everything was dying. And so everything had this really strong melancholy to it. It pointed to the inherent transience of all existence. The fact that everything that you love and appreciate is going to fade away at some point, and that gives it this delicious, bittersweet tinge. And so when you have this sound of people beating kimono into shape, combine that with the autumn season and also the nighttime, which was the time of lovers, mind you, you had this perfect mixture of all of these really, really emotionally resonant ideas all contained within this one activity. And so the sound of beating cloth on an autumn night was very, very popular in Japanese poetry. And I know I've memorized several Japanese poems, specifically I've remember, rem memorized 100 Japanese poems, and a few of them talk about this sound of the beating of cloth. I also remember this instance from the tale of Genji, where Genji, being a high-ranking noble, a very high-ranking noble, steals away one night with a lady and they end up in a part of town that's not really fit for Genji's station. But Genji finally gets to hear the sound of beating cloth for the first time in an autumn night. 
and he is very, very stirred by it. And so this is all just to point out that, you know, even in the most simplistic of stories, if you really dig deep, you can find something in there. You can learn something. And I'm hoping that that's what I was able to do for you today. I hope that you learned something. I hope that you now understand a little bit more about ancient Japanese culture. And now you can take it to your friends and be like, oh, well, you may have watched a lot of anime, but did you know that they used to treat their kimono with starch and smashing it with a hammer? There you go. You're welcome. I gave you something that you can brag about, talk about around the water cooler or whatever. But that is going to be it for now. Again, much shorter of a story. So please, if you enjoyed what you heard, give this video a like. Please subscribe. We just broke 100 not that long ago at time of recording. And I'm very grateful for the support. I'm grateful for everybody who does watch. And hopefully I can continue bringing more and more of this to you guys in gratitude. And please share with your weeb friends again so you can tell them how much smarter you are than them about classical Japanese literature and culture. Unless you are the weeb friend then you can add that to your repertoire of things that you want to talk to your friends about that they really don't actually care, but they'll just roll their eyes and good-naturedly give you a, a hear-see because, you know, they love you. <laughs> Definitely not speaking from experience on that one. But anyway, seriously, I appreciate it. Ito katejike no koso haberikere. But that will be it. Thank you very much, and see you in the next one. Adios.